Chapter 26, Something Really Awful. The Jaguar man recognized the name of the street that Rico's brother lived on. He used to live nearby. There were many stoplights to wait for, shopping centers to pass by, beautiful palm trees. Rico had come a long, long way to be this silent, so close to his destination. The neighborhood, the neighborhood Hanson turned into was filled with houses beyond the wildest dreams of anyone from Los Arboles. I myself was daring to dream that I would be able to work alongside Rico, cleaning the swimming pools. If not, his brother might let me clean the cars that he bought and sold. Hansen braked across the street from the number we were looking for. Three, two, one. He let us out. He said he would go and get gas, then come back to see how things turned out. We stood on the sidewalk across the street. I felt like hiding as cars went by. Some of the drivers were talking on cell phones. All it would take was for one of them to call the Border Patrol. Ronaldo is married. I know that much, Rico said. I know he has kids, but I don't know how many or anything about them. What are you getting at? I'm thinking Ronaldo must be away at work. I don't see a truck for his swimming pool business. There's a car. Probably his wife is home. Go find out. If all comes down to this, Rico said, all my hopes and dreams... And I feel sick. Go, Mano. I'll be waiting right here. I sat on the curb. Rico dragged himself across the street and up to the front door. He pressed a button. A woman with a curly dog in her arms came to the door. They talked. Something wasn't right. She was shaking her head. She pointed to the next house, then closed the door. Rico called me over. It's this house over here. She wouldn't explain. I must have got the number wrong. I want you to come with me. Okay, I said. The man who answered the door was mo the door was mostly bald and very well fed. I'm Rico, Rico said. The man stared at him. Ronaldo, it, it's me, your youngest brother, all the way from Los Arboles. I'm not Ronaldo, the man said as, as a boy of nine or ten came to the door and stared. The boy was drinking a can of soda. It took a few seconds to unravel the confusion. Rico had the address right in the first place. Ronaldo lived next door, or used to. The neighbor explained that Ronaldo and his family had left in the middle of the night about three weeks ago. Why? Rico asked. He would have been arrested. His family would have been deported. Arrested for what? Stealing cars, the boy blurted out. SUVs, vans, and pickups, the neighbor said. Every week or so, there'd be a new one in front of his house, who we believed him when he said he was buying and selling them. He always said it was a way of making some extra money. Omar's in jail, the boy interrupted. Who's Omar? asked Rico. One of Ronaldo's sons, the man answered. Omar was always getting into trouble. Why was Omar arrested? The neighbor, gr the neighbor grimaced and said, the, po the police have connected him to something really awful. What is it? Just a couple of hours before Ronaldo took off, there had been a shooting during a high-speed chase on the freeway. One coyote group got crazy mad at another for taking their mojados. Four people got killed, the boy explained. The two coyotes in front and the two, moja and the two of the mojados under the camper shell. That's enough, Juan, his father said. Go back to your PlayStation. You think Ronaldo's son was really involved? Rico asked. He was in the van that did the shooting. The police think that Ronaldo or his son were stealing vehicles to be used in smuggling wets across the border. The neighbor looked at his watch. That's all I know. He reached for the doorknob. I wondered if Rico was thinking what I was thinking. If we had arrived here earlier and started working for Ronaldo, we might have been criminals and not even known it. Can you help us out? Rico pleaded. We have nowhere to go. We were hoping to find work. Sorry, the man said, then his face hardened. I can't get myself or my family involved in this. He closed the door on us. As we walked across the street, Rico's eyes weren't even focusing. I had no idea, he said. Maybe your father was right, I said. What are you talking about? Your father told me Ronaldo wasn't honest. Maybe he knew something. When? When did my father tell you that? Right after you left, 
when I had to tell him you'd gone north. Why didn't you tell me about this before? When we met in Nogales, I started to tell you about that night. You cut me off. You didn't want to hear anything about your parents. We go kick the curb. Okay, let's forget about that. The question is, what do I do now? What do we do now? We find work, I said. What else? Didn't that gabacho who gave us a ride say he'd come back? What's taking him so long? Rico's face flushed with anger. I bet he's long gone. Well, he said he would take us to Tuscan, and he did. He lied, Victor. He said he was going to come back after he got gas, and he didn't. Now what do we do? Figure out how to get to La Pera Flaca, where there's work in the onions and then in the chiles. Miguel might be there. Ah, the great Miguel. I know you're disappointed, Rico. Disappointed isn't a strong enough word. Just then a red vehicle rounded the corner, the bearded man at the wheel. The window came down. I got something to eat, Hanson said. I hope you like burgers and fries and Cokes. We ate at a small park nearby on a table under a cottonwood tree. Rico explained about his brother leaving in the middle of the night, but nothing about why. Hanson asked what we were going to do next. I told him about La Pera Flaca and Miguel, how we needed another ride. The Jaguar man was giving it some thought. Hitchhiking? You'd have no chance. Do you have any ideas? I asked hopefully. Only one. Let's go for another drive. Many thanks, Rico and I both said at once. But no farther. Not to Chicago. We drove east on the interstate, with me expecting a border patrol block, roadblock any minute. An hour and 15 minutes is a long time to hold your breath. By the grace of God, Hanson got off the freeway at Wilcox without being stopped. His map showed a dead-end road going north, but no m marked towns. Our gabacho friend went to ask directions at the KFC. I thought of my little brother. When my family would go to Silao, Chew Chewy would beg to eat there, but we couldn't afford it. Chewie always called it the little old man. Hanson came back chuckling. I should have guessed. The skinny dog is just a nickname. Mexican humor. La Pera Flaca has another name. The Winchester Heights. It's 15 or 20 miles up a gravel road, but it's not marked. If we leave Cochise County, we've gone too far. We started into the desert on the gravel road. Now it was my turn to have my hopes as high as the sky. All my thoughts were on my lone wolf. Wait for me there, Miguel had said. I'll be along. Was he waiting for me? I had a powerful feeling that he was. If they deported him as quickly as before, he would be there by now. This has to be it, Hanson said. We had just topped a rise. Ahead lay many dozens of trailers and small houses scattered across the desert. The street into La Pera Flaca was as rough as any road I'd ever seen along the border. The Ford trailer looked like it must be a store. It had a Coke machine. Dave Hansen came to a stop in front of it. We knew better than to ask him to wait. He had a long way to go to get back to Bavo Quivari Peak. We thanked him as we got as we were getting out. It's nothing, he said. I told him that my family would always be in his debt. Good luck to you both. And to you, I said. I hope you see the Jaguar. He drove away with a smile on his face. Rico was wrinkling his nose at the smell of raw sewage. I remembered a remark of Miguel's and was confident we found the right place. We would soon find out our fate. La Pera Flaca? I asked the man coming out of the trailer door, with a bag of potato chips. Yes, he said. The woman behind the counter knew Miguel, but from the year before, but from the year before. If he hadn't arrived, she said, I would have, rec if he had arrived, she said, I would have recognized him. She reached for her burning cigarette and pulled deeply on the smoke, her face all bones and hollows. She had sorrowful eyes. My disappointment was deep. So was Rico's. He looked sick. For all his comments, he had been counting on Miguel, too. The Border Patrol must have put him in jail, I said. Maybe not, said the woman. From what I hear, everyone is being bussed back to the border. So many are coming across. There's no room in the jails. I hope you are right. But if so, he would have come here. I'm sorry. Bad luck comes in many shapes and sizes. What else can I do for you boys? 
Is there work here? Not enough, the sad, the sad lady said. The onions are about gone, and the early work on the chiles is mostly done. Many of the workers are leaving. Where are the fields? I, don't, I didn't see any. Most of them are an hour away. How long would we have to wait until the work picks up? She reached for a cigarette. July, until the chiles begin to ripen.